So, so what is an instruction set architecture? So, I have a hardware there are some instructions which this hardware can understand those ins instructions are called machine instructions these machine instructions have to meet two ends this should satisfy the need of the compilers and on the other hand it should also be implementable. Okay. So, so the, the, ins, the machine instructions rather the instructions that are understandable by the machine uh, have two ends to meet one thing is it should be it should satisfy the needs of the compiler and at the same time it should be implementable on hardware. Okay. Now, that means when these machine instructions are given to the hardware, the hardware understands this what do you mean by implementable on hardware? It should be understandable to the hardware in some sense. What do you mean by understandable to the hardware? The hardware actually interprets these instructions in some form. Right? So, implicitly there are two translations that are happening when you write a program. So, I have a high level language there is one level of translation I could call translation 1 which gives you a compiled code. in machine instructions right so this is an explicit translation wherein you can see the executable code encoded in the machine language right in the language of the machine now these instructions are pushed one by one into the hardware so the hardware now interprets each of these instruction for execution so there is an implicit translation that happens at at hardware level. So, when we are looking at instructions there is a translation or what we call as compilation which is explicit and then there is what another translation which we call it as interpretation which is implicit. So, in last course I have uh, I have distinguished you between what we mean by a compilation and an interpretation what is compilation I take a program compile it end to end convert it end to end translate it end to end and create another executable which is the in the form of the target language this is called compilation right. But then take a program take every instruction execute then take the next instruction execute right. So, this is actually called as interpretation. Okay. So, 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 so the, 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 the difference between a translation, a compiled program and a tra interpreted program is that this is one interesting example. If I take the hardware, uh, the first level of translation which takes the higher level language program and converts into a machine language that is compilation. Now, this machine language program is taken uh, is input to the system hardware which takes instruction by instruction understands it and executes it. Somehow we should know that this is add this is multiply. So, there is something some 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 semantics associated with the instruction which is understood by the hardware and that is basically interpretation right. So, when I look at uh, you know so when I am trying to develop an instruction set architecture I should look now at two aspects one thing is there is a great compiler need compiler needs so many things. So, I need to have those features which will be supported, but at the same time those features cannot be so fancy that it is not implementable on the hardware. So, I have to strike a balance between this and that balance is what uh, gives you gives rise to a bigger classification of computing systems in general while based on what how biased 
I am to the hardware versus how biased I am to the compiler, right? So, I can be very compiler as an instruction set architecture, I can be very compiler friendly. At the same time, I can be literally a, a hardware, uh, I can make the hardware mad, okay? I could have so much complexity. On the other hand, I could be very much hardware friendly while the, uh, while I will be very un, uh, unfriendly to the compiler. So, so, depending on how close the instruction set architecture or how friendly quote unquote uh, the instruction set architecture is to the compiler versus the hardware, there is a classification of computing systems based on that and that is what we mean by RISC versus CISC. RISC actually stands for reduced instruction set computers. This act, CISC actually stands for complex instruction set computers. Okay. So, what do you mean by reduced instruction set computer? You have already done in your uh, third semester course, what you did there is a RISC machine, okay? So, the, the, the small ha hack hardware that you made, the small processor, toy processor that you made was a risk machine. In sense, what do you mean by that is that this risk is more hardware friendly. Hardware friendly in the sense that it has minimum number of instructions. Right? And then <coughs> all instructions are of same length. So, every instruction is say 4 bytes, right? In this case, uh, if I have minimum number of machine instructions. So, so, I may not have any fancy machine instructions. So, if I have a fancy compiler requirement, right? Then I need to realize that compiler requirement using these so-called so primitive instructions. So, it makes the compiler's job extremely complex because I have very, very primitive instructions and say I have to support, say suppose in hack, the, uh, the hardware that you generated in your third semester, suppose I want to put say protection. I want to introduce segmentation, it will be, it will kill you, right? But if I do not have segmentation, you will see in the afternoon, uh, tomorrow's afternoon class, we cannot do even compilation. So, we are trying to do something there, but a lot of things that we keep in mind are going to be, you know, complex, right? So, we, for example, if I say that every instruction should be just, so 32 bytes, I cannot even initialize a, a, a register of 32 bit length with an immediate value because I need 32 bit immediate value. The 32 bit immediate value itself will consume 4 bytes. So, how will I have an instruction that will initialize a register with a 32 byte value? It is going to be extremely complex. So, we have to do lot of roundabout ways by which I can go and initialize a register, a 32 bit register with a value, right? So, the, these are all very, very difficult things that come up. So, if I have all instructions are of same length, then even basic initialization of constants into registers, like I go and say A equal to 515 and A is a 32-bit integer, I cannot assign 515 to A as an assembly language because if I want to put 32 bits, immediately 4 bytes are consumed. Each instruction can be only 4 bytes, correct? So, there are very different tricks that I need to follow to basically get that value of you know some some 500 510 or something into that value a it can become multiple instructions etc etc et okay so so uh, i will talk about the arm uh, uh, instruction set architecture from the risk point of view while you will be writing a, a small mini kernel in cisc so i'll not bother to teach about cisc you will learn it through your assembly language but about risk we'll we'll talk a little bit more in subsequent classes also. So, in essence, 
risk is hardware friendly it has minimum number of machine instructions it it has all instructions are of same length by this what happens you are the, the the second level of translation that, that i told you namely that interpretation is easy the 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 con of this risk is that it is compiler compilers hell okay it will create nightmares for the compiler especially when i want to support fancy things this becomes extremely complex for you to code translate on the other hand this is a complex instruction set computers where this is completely hardware hell this is hardware 7 while this is hardware cell in the sense that it will have thousand of hundreds of instructions the instruction set manual of intel intel is an example of this intel amd especially the x86 right is an example of this while on the other hand here arm mips these are all risk machines okay we will have hundreds of instruction the manual is around 500, 500 just the instruction set alone is 570 or 580 pages okay which will basically describe this instruction so this is one thing and they will not be of not of same length if it is not of same length so I have a variable i, I associate it with a register eax or whatever and I say I want to initialize with any constant I can do it. So the compiler need not actually spend lot of time to init even initialize a particular register with a, uh, a particular constant okay are you able to get this. So if the instructions are not of same length then it becomes much more easy but then what is the interpretation is going to be extremely difficult. but surely it this is compilers heaven why is the interpretation going to be difficult why is the interpretation going to be difficult Why? Because uh, we initially we don't know of how much length the instruction is going to come. So, so before that we have to find out like on based on the length we have to find out what kind of instruction it is, and then we have to disassemble it. So I don't know. So so when I fetch something from the memory, I be, I fetch it in blocks. Okay. So uh, oh, so when I fetch something, say I can have one byte instructions in x86. Okay then instruction can run to several bytes. So I could have several instructions in one fetch or not even half an instruction in a single fetch and an instruction can start one part and end somewhere else in some other next fetch okay it can spawn across two fetches. So and so if I am going to have one byte instruction to say uh, 100 as a 20 byte instructions or 10 byte instructions right suppose I am going to have this variety of things now your decoding itself becomes complex I have to see the first byte then the second byte then the third byte etc right but on the other hand if I have a fixed length an instruction basically has what what do you what do you what are the what are the things inside an instruction what are the things inside an instruction what will an instruction carry what do those bits represent it will represent two things right it will represent opcode and operands right add something add is an opcode on what what should i add it becomes the operand so every instruction will have opcode op and it will also have operands 
right. In a fixed length, normally what happens is we will reserve op, say 5, 5 bits for opcode, 4 bits for operand 1, 4 bits for operand 2 and so on, okay. Let us say like this. So, when an instruction comes, I can go and find out what the opcode is and concurrently I can also go and find out where what the operands are, right. If you carefully look at what you have done in hack, that is what you have done, right. In, in an instruction of 32 bit length, we know exactly how to interpret it. So, we know exactly where the operand 1 is, where the operand 2 is, which are the bytes or the bits which are going to specify the operands that we will know very clearly in a fixed length instruction. So, when I get 32 bit I can fix first 5 bits are for opcode, the remaining things are like this they are organized. So, when when the hardware see hardware is having several transistors right, one, one part of the hardware starts interpreting what the instruction is concurrently the other set of hardware can start fetching the operands, understand and start fetching the operands. But in a in a in a variable length instruction, I do not know where these type of operands are going to be there. So, in a variable length instruction, when I want to process a decode a variable instruction, I go byte by byte and then find out what where the opcode ends, where the op operand starts, etc. But in a fixed length instruction, I need not go byte by byte, I, I have more concurrency in understanding that instruction. What do you mean by you know fetching the operand, fetching this? In? I am trying to understand what that instruction is. So, my decoding becomes extremely fast and decoding and the corresponding actions become extremely fast in the case of risk instructions because of fixed length while the same decoding and other things become extremely complex in the case of CISC because I do not know where I should look for the operands. So, the decoding essentially becomes almost sequential in the case of CISC. In sequential instance, I have 8 bytes of instruction. I do not know whether 8 byte will finish off, will it have only half the instruction or it is having more than one instruction or it is exactly the instruction. So, I see start looking at byte 1, based on that I start looking at bytes 2, 3, etc. So, it can become almost sequential for me to decode an instruction. So, that is, that is the basic uh, difficulty. So, risk, so my interpretation at risk level is going to be extremely easy while CISC level is going to be complex, but on the other hand from the compiler's perspective risk is very, very difficult in sense it, it takes lot more effort for the compiler to generate a risk uh, based uh, you know machine code while on the CISC it becomes much more easy, right. So, so this is, this is, this is a classification of computers today. ARM um, is a risk processor, risk V is a risk processor, while on the other hand um, uh, Intel x86 is a CISC processor. So, based on how the instruction set architecture is designed, based on the length of the instruction sets, there is now a distinction between two process, two classes of processors which comes as CISC and RISC. Are able to follow? Yes or no? Okay. So, let us go to the uh, next uh, step. <clears throat> One thing is, so as I told you RISC or CISC, the instruction has two parts. One is the opcode, another is the operand. So, I could have one operand instruction, I could have multi operand instructions. Operands are of two types. One a destination operand and a source operand. Suppose I say add EAX comma EBX in NASM, EBX and EAX both are source operand and EAX is a destination operand. So, I could have an operand that is both source and destination. Now, there could be def there could be one operand or multi operands, in this case there are two, op two operands here, right. And uh, in addition, okay, the opcode, right, is the decision of what the opcode is, right, 
should be uh, should also be made. So that that is one very important. So when I am coming out with an instruction set architecture, what should be the opcode? What is the minimum opcode that is necessary? Somebody has to come out with. So what is the list? Why is this list? Right? So this this we need to come out with a very clear justification for that. Similarly, on the operand side, there could be multiple types of operands. So this is basically a register operand. Okay? I could have memory operands, I could have immediate operands. Memory operands are those that I want to add a register value with something in the memory. I want to move something from the memory into a register. I want to move something from a register into a memory. Right? So every operand can be a, a register operand, it can be an immediate a value that is. So for example, move EAX, 100. This 100 is a is a immediate operand, EAX is a register operand. I can say move EX, 500. This is a memory operand. The address that of that memory which I am trying to access is the value of EX, and 500 is an immediate operand. So I could have instructions with one or multiple operands. We already saw last time, right? Div some ECX right we saw last time right this this basically gives you EAX content of EAX by content of content of EAX by content of ECX correct so I could have register operands uh, operands can be one or money so this is a one operand instruction but actually there are implicit operands inside this I could have multiple operands and this operands can be of three types. It can be a register operand, it can be a memory operand, it can also be an immediate operand. Okay. So in the in the assembly language lab class, we will see more of these instructions and operating uh, operation modes. Okay. So so just for our understanding now, we need to understand what are operands. On the other side, how do we dis how do we so how do we fix these operands? Size of these operands. So as you have seen in the Intel manual, you would see 8-bit operand, you see 16-bit operand, 32-bit operands, etc. So how do you fix the size of these operands? Opcode will not tell you the size, right? So how do you fix the size of the operands? Database. Huh? Ah, data types. So in a programming language, there could be multiple data types. For example, character is 8-byte. 8 bits, so 1 byte. So I will have 1 byte operands. Then we have we have lot of times where we need we, we use uh, you know short variables, right? So we have uh, that can also be 8 bits or 16 bits. Then I have long variable. I have long long variables. I can go up to 64 bits or 128 bits today. So <coughs> so depending on the size of the operands which your compiler wants, comp who supports data types? Who is responsible for understanding and you know uh, and interpreting data types in your so I have operating I have hardware I have micro architecture then I have operating system then compiler etc who is responsible for interpreting uh? the compiler is responsible for interpreting what each data type is right so if I have a 64 bit compiler then a normal int in C would be 64 bits there versus the same int for a 32 bit compiler would be a 4 byte. So I may I can have inconsistencies in the word in the way I am I, I am looking at int declaration int in C depending on which compiler I am using, right? So to support the needs of the compiler, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the ha hardware needs to support the need support the different issues that arise during compiling, and one such issue is the length of these operands, and that the hardware has to help. So that's how operand sizes are being fixed. Right. So Intel as such supports 8-bit operand, 16-bit operand, 32-bit, 64-bit. Now 
even larger. Able to are you able to follow what I am trying to say? So, so this is how I fix operands. Finally, the compiler has to interpret it. Your syntax is different. You you have a syntax, right? So you go and say that within that scope, uh, you can make a scope-based type analysis, correct? Right? If you when you are studying uh, your popular right principles of programming language, you will be uh, learning. Hopefully, you'll be learning a lot more other things. So the scope. What do, what do you do mean by a scope of a variable? Suppose I am assigning. A, say a variable c to an integer, automatically I will go, the, so it is in the scope of an integer. So I will go and declare c as an integer. This is how many programming languages do interpret what it is. Right? Suppose I go and say c equal to a plus b, very interesting here, c equal to a plus b. Right? Now, if a is floating point, and I have not declared b, I can go and say b is also floating point. Because this addition, right, there are two adders, one adder which is a integer adder, another adder is a floating point adder, which could have several integer adders in, in, internally, but a floating point adder addition is different from a, uh, a integer addition. So the, here itself I have to see whether both are, one of them is floating point, then I will make this a plus as floating point. So in, when I interpret this, I will use just add if a and b are integers. But if a, one of them is a floating point, then I need f add. This is Intel, Intel instructions. So the compiler actually sees uh, the different variables there and based on those variables, uh, the types of those variables, it will come out with a uh, conclusion of whether it is a floating point or integer. Okay. So a lot of context dependent analysis happens in weakly typed languages where the types are not explicitly stated nor the language insists that the types need to be stated. There are a lot of programming, programming uh, you know, benefits, there are a lot of benefits for the pro programmer if the language is weakly typed. Right? If it is very strongly typed, it makes a verification easy but for the programmer it may not give you that much amount of benefits. So what are weakly typed and strongly typed languages, you will learn more in your uh, popular course, your uh, principles of programming languages course. But as far as we are concerned, <coughs> there are some data types and that dictate the size of the operands. Now how do you go about opcodes? How do you decide that I need add, I need subtract, I do not need this, so how do you come out? Is that some systematic way? Suppose you are asked to design a computer tomorrow. Like we did design hack. How did we arrive at the different opcodes? No way. Who, who will give you the opcodes? You are designing an ALU depending on the opcodes. Correct? Please understand this. The hardware is not still available to you. You are now talking about the interface. You are now talking about the instruction set architecture. After that only you are going to build an hardware. Okay. So who will decide what are the instructions that should be inside instruct or what are what is the process that you would like to follow when suppose you are asked to build an architecture of what would be the instructions inside that. So how do we arrive at an instruction set architecture? This is a question. Are you, are you getting what I am trying to say? We basically go through a yeah, yeah, lot of experimentation on this. This decision of what instructions that should be put inside an opcode comes out of lot of empirical analysis. Empirical means experimental analysis. So you take lot of examples from the domain. So your system is expected to serve in different domains. It might be that I need to open browser, I may not have to do some e-transactions, I may not have to support some multimedia facilities. So your system, and I have to do a lot of scientific computation, so every system will have certain role for which it is designed for, right? And from there, you take all the applications in that role and understand what are the common functionalities that are executed by those operations, by those uh, case studies. 
and those functionalities the common functionalities eventually translate into opcodes right i will do lot of additions so add should be one opcode opcode i i will do lot of bitways manipulation so bitways and and bitways are and bitways not they should be uh, they should be part of your instruction set architecture so like that we go and look at different uh, different applications for which the system has to cater to and then depending upon the need of the application you start introducing instructions which shall match uh, the need for the application so the instruction set architecture at least the opcode what are the opcodes that need to go in this is completely dictated by the application or the application domain for which the processor is intended for suppose i am trying to make a network processor and there i go and put some fancy multimedia instruction right it will be useless right what sort of instruction will i put in a network processor i'll try and put certain packet processing instructions because a network processor which is going to be sitting inside a router is going to get packet it is going to process that packet and send it across or make some decisions okay right so when i am looking at an opcode for a network processor i will put certain things related to packetization or related to retransmission there rather than then putting some multimedia instructions there but when i am looking at a home pc or in a, a processor for your ipad or this thing we will start looking more on the media instructions right multimedia instructions etc so there is a uh, there is a enough amount of work that has that need to be done there are a lot lot more work that need to be done in identifying what are the opcodes and for each of those opcode what are the types of operands that opcode can support and so how do you codify those operands all these things form basis of how do you develop an instruction set architecture okay so in tomorrow's afternoon class tomorrow morning i'll continue on this but tomorrow's afternoon class we will start looking at the cisc architecture of x86 that will be a very good case study for cisc while for the risc we will do something with respect to arm process okay fan okay thanks